My opponents profess to be, or at least have been widely described, as representatives of something called the New Atheism. Yet I have to point out that the kind of reasoning on display here is not only entirely familiar to me, but of a particular kind that even I, during my own years as an atheist, could not in all intellectual conscience endorse. Perhaps we'd better examine it. Oh yes, I've heard that all too often. I used to be an atheist, but it's the oldest trick in the book. Perhaps we ought to bring this conversation back to the matter of evidence. Evidence. It's a great honor to introduce you to uh, Mr. Peter Williams. He is a, a philosopher and a Christian apologist. He works for the uh, Damaris, Damaris Trust in Southampton, and he's also the Associate Assistant Professor in Communication and Worldviews at Gimlekollen School, that's Norwegian of Journalism and Communication in uh, the South of Norway. Mr. Williams has just published, in fact, this is the official book launch of his new book, C.S. Lewis versus the New Atheists. And I may, I may tell you that this is the only book that our very own Dr. Michael Ward has written a preface for. Uh, it says quite a bit. Now here's a snippet from the preface. This book shows the breadth, depth, and durability of Lewis's Christian apologetics. Uh, William Lane Craig, who many of you know, has said of Mr. Williams' work, Peter Williams is a bright young British philosopher and a skillful debater with whom I had the privilege of partnering in our Cambridge Union Society debate in 2011. I recommend his work enthusiastically. Now, this book is uh, for sale for us only at a special price for £10, and you can buy it from, the, uh, from Mike Parsons, here, yeah, Mark Parsons is there. He represents the uh, publisher Paternoster, or in American Latin, Paternoster. <laughs> I, I, I want to say that the promotion video for this, it's a five minute video that's been acted um, uh, and gone viral on, in social media, is probably the best I've ever seen. So you should, you should definitely Google it up. Um, Peter Williams will be signing the books after his talk, and, and I, I do believe that you reserved six copies for me. That would be good. Please join me in uh, welcoming Mr. Peter Williams. Well, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. It's a, a real honor for me to be here in a wonderful uh, venue in which to launch uh, such a book, uh, and in such a year as well, in the 50th anniversary year of Lewis's death, of course. Um, so I hope you'll get your two pounds worth this evening, uh, and I'll start off by saving you uh, any Googling, because I'll start off by actually showing you that YouTube video that we uh, 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 commissioned from uh, the great uh, Peter Byram, who made this uh, for me uh, to advertise this book. So I'll show you the video, and then I'll uh, unpack uh, some aspects of the book, hopefully enough to tantalise you into buying a copy.
we can all understand how a man forgives offences against himself. You tread on my toes, I forgive you. You steal my money, I forgive you. But what should we make of a man, himself unrobbed and untrodden upon, who announced that he forgave you for treading on other men's toes and stealing other men's money? Asinine fatuity is the kindest description we should give of his conduct. This is Lewis. A fourth possibility, almost too obvious to need mentioning, is that Jesus was honestly mistaken. Plenty of people are. C.S. Lewis, who should have known better, I know not how many of my publications you have read, Professor Dawkins, but I think you misconstrue the nature of this trilemma. Let's take another look and make sure we've left no stone unturned. Lewis, who's argued so well up till then, can't complete a syllogism. Poor guy. Are you sure about that? You never could quite do that. Tell me, oh, you're chewing more than you bite off. My good chap. Please, call me Jack. That's precisely the problem with faith, believing in something for which there isn't any evidence. On the contrary, faith is the art of holding on to things your reason has once accepted, in spite of your changing moods. Are you sure nobody's explained that to you already? There is no good reason to believe in God. But there we must come to the very existence of reason itself, and whether that may constitute what you call evidence. If science can't give you the answer, philosophy won't, and certainly not religion. Bless me, what do they teach them at these schools? That gives you a pretty good flavour of where the book's uh, coming from, really. Uh, it was an edition of Wired magazine that actually dubbed the new atheism as the new atheism. Uh, and uh, this group of atheistic writers who became prominent, uh, particularly after the events of 9-11 in 2001, um, foremost amongst which is obviously Richard Dawkins and his best-selling book, The God Delusion, and other people like uh, Sam Harris here and Daniel Dayett and Christopher Hitchens, who you heard at the, uh, the beginning of that video and so on, have been quite accurately described in this article by Gary Wolfe this way. He says, The new atheists condemn not just belief in God, but respect for belief in God. That is, religion's not only wrong, it's evil. It's not only an intellectually mistaken position but that it is a morally subpar position to hold. Particularly at the heart of this New Atheist critique, I think, is a misunderstanding of what religious people must mean by having faith, by having faith in God. Um, and that uh, misunderstanding of faith, and actually, as I'll show later as well, a misunderstanding of reason, on the other side of that coin, I think really gets uh, to, the, to the nub of the issue that the new atheists have with religion. Oxford, of course, is the academic powerhouse of the new atheism. Of course, there are plenty of professors here at Oxford who are known as critics of the, the new atheism. But, as you can see from the listing here, then lots of the new atheists, particularly English-speaking new atheists, uh, and that's the majority of the, the movement, although there are a few French writers and so on, did their doctorates at Oxford under the auspices of people who were colleagues of Lewis's at Oxford. So Lewis was at Oxford at the same time as people like A.J. Eyre, and uh, A.J. Eyre... Um, as we mentioned uh, down here, um, supervised A.C. Grayling doing his doctorate 
um, here at Oxford and so on. So the new atheists are one sort of intellectual generation remove from Lewis, but are very influenced, very influenced by views in philosophy that were uh, having a particular cachet at that uh, early 20th century uh, stage of things. Uh, and they're sort of haunted by the ghost of logical positivism, as I say in, in the book. And Lewis is an obvious intellectual counterfoil to the new atheism, partly because of this Oxford connection, um, partly because the new atheists themselves acknowledge Lewis uh, as an influential Christian voice, whom they, they mention quite a lot in their writings, if only to try and sort of trash his legacy or pour cold water on the thought that he is someone with whom they owe any serious engagement. It's a little odd. Um, Christopher Hitchens called Lewis the main chosen propaganda vehicle for Christianity. So I'm very happy to adopt Lewis as a propaganda vehicle to engage the new atheists and to point out that although they mention him quite a lot, Dawkins mentions him in the preface of uh, the paperback edition of The God Delusion, um, he even makes it into Daniel Dennett's uh, Breaking the Spell, but only as a, a quotation under one of the chapter headings. But despite their mentioning of him, they don't really engage with the issues that Lewis engaged with that moved him himself from being an atheist through eventually, through a long and winding road uh, to being a Christian. I think the difference between Lewis the atheist and these neo-atheists is that Lewis, who was grounded in the tradition of classical philosophy, in classical literature, resisted particularly resisted modernistic approaches to knowledge, if you can put it like that. And I'll unpack what I, what I mean by that. Lewis the atheist um, would have particularly mentioned the problem of evil as one of his reasons for not believing in God. He says, um, before I read Lucretius, I felt the force of his argument, surely the strongest of them all for atheism. Had God designed the world, it would not be a world so frail and faulty as we see. And this contributed to his uh, loss of faith, uh, not with a sense of loss, uh, but with the greatest relief as a young man. But for Lewis, uh, evil was a real thing, an objectively real reality that any god worthy of the name really, objectively, ought not to allow. And therefore, the apparent uh, obvious existence of objectively evil things counted against the existence of God. But in order to hold that view, Lewis saw that he, he, he had to take a, a broad enough view of how we know reality to accommodate the reality of these objective values. And this is, of course, someone who was not unacquainted with suffering in his life, despite you know, the sort of image you might have of the, the late Lewis and the cloistered life of the Lewis professor and all that. This was a, a young man who went through the trenches of World War I. He, he says in his uh, biography, uh, Surprised by Joy, I've gone to sleep marching and woken again and found my, my, myself marching still. And he recalls the, the frights, the cold, the smell of high explosive, the, the horribly smashed men still moving like half-crushed beetles, the sitting or standing corpses, the landscape of sheer earth without a blade of grass on it. Douglas Gresham recalls in his book Jack's Life how Lewis spent his 19th birthday in the frontline trenches of World War I before being wounded during the Battle of Arras when a, a creeping barrage from the British side... Lewis and his troops were marching forward under the cover of this moving barrage. The moving barrage was moving, but in the wrong direction. He says, as they advanced with bayonets ready, the barrage stopped advancing and began to come back towards them. Soon Jack and his men were being bombarded by their own artillery. And to his helpless fury, Jack watched his men being blown to pieces and the constant roar of their own artillery support. Suddenly Jack saw a blinding light, everything went completely silent, and then the ground came up slowly and hit him. Jack had been hit by the concussion and shrapnel from a British shell. His trusted sergeant 
had been between Jack and the shell when it exploded and was blown to bits. And Lewis wanted to be able to say, those things that I experienced, God really ought not to have allowed that if there is such a being. That is wrong, that is evil. Evil is an objectively real thing, not something we've invented, but something we discover in reality. He says it's a thing that is really there, not made up by ourselves. I quote here from The Problem of Pain, where he says, Not many years ago, when I was an atheist, if anyone had asked me, why don't you believe in God? My reply would have run like this. If you ask me to believe this universe is the work of a benevolent and omnipotent spirit, I reply that the evidence points in the opposite direction. Either there is no spirit behind the universe, or else a spirit indifferent to good or evil, or else an evil spirit, as some of his poetry toyed with indeed. In mere Christianity, he references this issue again and says, my argument against God was that the universe seemed so cruel and unjust. But how had I got, how did I know, this idea of just and unjust? A man doesn't call a line crooked unless he has some idea of a straight line. You need some standard that you're comparing things to when you say that falls short of the standard. In other words, if the whole show were bad and senseless from A to Z, so to speak, why did I, who was supposed to be part of the show, find myself in such violent reaction to it? He says, of course, I I could have given up on my idea of justice by saying it was nothing but a private idea of my own, just a subjective reality. But if I did that, then my argument against God collapsed too. For the argument depended on saying that the world was really unjust, not simply that it didn't happen to please my fancies. So in the very act of trying to prove that God does not exist, in other words, that the whole of reality was senseless, I I found I was forced to assume that one part of reality, my idea of justice, was full of sense. Consequently, atheism turns out to be too simple. So it was grappling with evil as an objective reality that for Lewis, first of all, provided the foundation of an argument against God and then began worrying away at him as to whether this argument against God might not, in a sense, sort of be boomeranging on him, throwing it out there. But then it it raises, as it were, the problem of goodness right back at him. You could put his argument like this. If, If... materialism, if metaphysical naturalism is true, nothing is objectively evil. He says in his essay on living in the atomic age, if nature is the only thing in existence, then of course there can be no other source for our standards. They must, like everything else, be the unintended and meaningless outcome of blind forces. But premise two, something is objectively evil. From which it follows, if those two are true, it follows that metaphysical naturalism is false. Extending it even more, as he did, of course, he actually argues that the best explanation of of that idea of justice being objectively true, what is that standard? That that is the character of a holy good God, of an omnibenevolent God. He says, the defiance of a good atheist hurled at an apparently ruthless and idiotic idiotic cosmos is really an unconscious homage to something, to something in or behind that cosmos that he recognises as infinitely valuable and authoritative, justly authoritative. For if mercy and justice were really only private whims of his own, he couldn't go on being indignant. The fact that he arraigns heaven itself for disregarding them means that at some level of his mind he knows that they're enthroned in a higher heaven still. (coughs) We know um, from Lewis's library um, and we know from his his diaries and things as well that he actually read W.R. Sawley's Gifford lectures on moral values and the idea of God and later owned uh, this book a very influential uh, putting of that kind of, of moral argument 
And uh, his moral argument in Mere Christianity, I think, is a sort of popularisation of uh, Sawley's uh, Gifford lectures, in a sense. It's not just atheists who... Th- uh, well, atheist turned theist Lewis, who was thinking along this line, but, but here's a, another famous Oxford atheist, J.R. Mackey. Um, his book, The Miracle of, of Theism, was a uh, set text reading when I was doing philosophy at Cardiff. He said, if there are objective values they make the existence of a God more probable than it would have been without them. Thus we have a defensible argument from morality to the existence of God. But of course, Mackey remained an atheist. How did he contrive to do that whilst making this linkage between the existence of objective values and a good argument for the existence of God? By denying the existence of objective values. He said, so... If values are subjective, this problem does not arise. And he wrote a book, famous book, called Ethics, Inventing Right and Wrong. But which is really the bigger problem, as it were. Um, Having to admit that there's some kind of omnibenevolent divine being in order to be able to say things like, it's objectively true to say that torturing small children for fun is wrong. Or, biting the bullet, as Mackey seemed willing to do, to say, OK, so since those would link, I'm not going to let God in the picture, I'm going to have to let go of objective values. I'm going to have to say it is about inventing what's right and wrong for you, me, us, different strokes for different folks. You know, you, I think it's morally wrong to torture small children for fun, that doesn't float my boat, but, you know, whatever, you know... <laughs> We just have a difference of opinion. I like strawberry ice cream. I think that's the best. You like vanilla? You know? We've got different tastes here. But it's not like I'm contradicting you when I say, no, look, strawberry's the best. Is morality really that kind of a subjective realm, as Mackie thought? We come back to uh, A.J. Eyre and his very influential book, Language, Truth and Logic. Lewis mentions it. In his, uh, in his letters, those plaguey philosophers whom we call logical positivists. Um, and of course, uh, Language, Truth and Logic was actually published after uh, Lewis had become a Christian. Um, but that kind of intellectual climate had been in the air for some time. Um, he even mentions in Surprised by Joy about um, William Kirkpatrick, who tutored him before he came to Oxford. And he says this, he says, if ever a man came near to being a purely logical entity, that man was Kirk. Born a little later, he would have been a logical positivist. The most casual remark was taken as a summons to disputation. I soon came to know the differing values of the three opinions. Openings. Uh, The loud cry of stop was flung in to arrest a torrent of verbiage which could not be endured a moment longer because it was wasting time, darkening counsel. Uh, the hastier and quieter, excuse, excuse me, uh, ushered in a correction or distinction parenthetical and betoked that just you know, set right, your remark might still, without absurdity, without absurdity, be allowed to reach completion. And the most encouraging of all was, I hear you. This meant that your remark was significant. And only required refutation. It had risen to the dignity of error. <laughs> uh, refutation, when we'd got so far, always followed the same lines. Had I read this? Had I studied that? Had I any statistical evidence? Had I any evidence in my own experience? And so on. Well, in his paper... The Language of Religion from 1960, I I think I detect a a, a peculiarly Lewisian argument against logical positivism. Um, It's not directly addressing that issue here, but I, I, I think you can at least piece together in the background of what he's saying the kind of argument that Lewis would have addressed to the logical positivists. He argues here that religious sayings are significant, meaningful if you meet them with a certain goodwill, a certain readiness to find meaning. The trouble with the positivists was, as as Aya sets it out in Language, Truth and Logic, they had this criterion, this rule, 
for when language is meaningful, when it's going to rise even to the dignity of being able to be false, shown wrong, like Kirkpatrick. Um, fine if your language is, is just tautological, you know, 2 plus 2 equals 4, of course, that's, that's meaningful, just true by definition. But otherwise, you've got to be able to check out, to verify, at least potentially verify, empirically, with your senses, um, at least indirectly, by extension, verify with your senses what you're talking about. Um, thus, if I say um, the bottle of water is on the table, I can, well, in this case, I can directly empirically verify that. I can, I can look at it, I can touch it, I can lick it, I can smell it. I can do all sorts of empirical things with this. So my statement may or may not be true, but if I make the statement the bottle of water is on the table, at least it's a meaningful statement that could be true or false. But if I say something like torturing small children for fun is wrong or rainbows are beautiful, um, I haven't even risen to the dignity of being able to be right or wrong. I'm just I'm uttering gibberish on a level with the bits of jabberwocky that Lewis Carroll didn't go on to define. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it was brilliant the slithy toads. We know what that means because he gives us the translation elsewhere. But later on, it's just, it's nonsense poetry. So these metaphysical statements about ethics, about aesthetics, about God are meaningless according to the verification theory of meaning. Well, Lewis says... Okay, some things said by religious people can't be treated exactly as we treat scientific statements. This isn't because they're statements of some special language. It would be truer to say that the scientific statements are the ones in the special language. And he argues that scientific and poetic language are two different artificial perfections of what he calls ordinary language. A longer, significant quote. He says, It seems to me to be a mistake to think that our experience in general can be communicated by precise and literal language, i.e. the language of empirical, measurable science, and that there's a special class of experience, say emotions or religious experience maybe, which can't. The truth seems to me to be the opposite. There is a special region of experience which can be communicated without poetic language, namely its common, measurable, empirical features. But most experience can't. To be incommunicable by scientific language is, so far as I can judge, the normal state of experience. The very essence of our life as conscious beings consists of something which cannot be communicated except by hints, similes, metaphors, the use of the emotions, which are pointers to it. In other words, the, the scientific language that describes measurable empirical experience in precise quantitative terms that can be tested by an instrument, as he says, is the exception to the general rule of ordinary language. It's the artificial perfection of ordinary language on which it depends. And this is the crucial move. The, the, the artificial scientific language depends upon the ordinary non-scientific language. And so it follows that the scientific language cannot, on pain of self-contradiction, be used to undermine the meaning or the meaningfulness of any propositions, including religious ones, that are expressed in ordinary language. Now, of course, logical positivism died multiple deaths in the mid-20th century, not least from the fact that, as people like H.D. Lewis pointed out, um, is the verification principle verifiable? Is it true by definition? Uh, whoops. No, it's not. Um, by its own law, 
it is literally meaningless. Um, not a good position for a philosophical viewpoint. Um, but, you know, this uh, way that Lewis attacks it, I think, is very interesting through his interest in the philosophy of language. And I trace that in the book to his interaction with people like Owen Barfield and J.R. Tolkien uh, as well. But it seems to me that although the new atheists disagree most of the time they manage to disagree with, with logical positivism. Sometimes they run aground on it when they're not being too careful. But they're haunted by the ghost of positivism in as much as, I say in the book, scientism is a big thing for the new atheists. Scientism simply attributes exclusive or near-exclusive rights over knowledge rather than meaningfulness to empirical scientific verification. That's the move. They sort of, OK, OK, statements can be meaningful without being empirically verifiable. Um, but the only way we can really know the truth about reality is through empirical means. On this, on either view, indeed, Lewis would say the world of facts without one trace of value and the world of feelings without one trace of truth or falsehood, justice or injustice, just confront each other and there's no reproachment possible between them. He says in his days as an, as, as an atheist, he, he felt that everything that he thought was true was meaningless and empty, and everything he thought was valuable and interesting was false. He felt himself being pulled apart by this dichotomy. Um, he says it's widely believed that scientific thought does put us in touch with reality, whereas moral or metaphysical thought doesn't. On this view, when we say that the universe is a space-time continuum, we're saying something about reality. Whereas if we say that men ought to have a living wage, we're only describing our own subjective feelings. Victor Stenger, physicist, new atheist writer, he complains that critics accuse new atheism of scientism which is the principle that science is the only means that can be used to learn about the world and humanity. Or at least that's hard scientism. Uh, they cannot quote a single new atheist who has said that, says Victor Stenger. Well, here's some quotes from a new atheist writer. This writer says that science does not require, nor does it use, any metaphysics. That science is belief in the presence of supportive evidence. And that faith, by contrast, is belief in the absence of supportive evidence. It seems to me that someone who holds these views amounts to someone who holds this scientific view. It seems to be describing the same position that Victor Stenger says new atheists don't hold. The interesting thing about these quotes is that they're all from Victor Stenger in his book, The New Atheism. Well, what about Peter Atkins, who in his book On Being says, the scientific method is the only means of discovering the nature of reality. The only way of acquiring reliable knowledge. Sounds like scientism to me. Or Richard Dawkins. For him, all beliefs fall into one of two categories. On the one hand, there's what he calls proper evidenced based belief. As he, I think, rather naively asserts in his book The Magic of Reality, he says the only good reason to believe that something exists is if there's real evidence that it does. We come to know what's real in one of three ways. We detect it directly using our five senses, empirical investigation. We detect it uh, indirectly using our senses aided by special instruments. Or even more indirectly by creating models of what might be real, and testing those models to see if they successfully predict things we can see directly or indirectly. It always comes back to our senses one way or another. On the other hand is the improper methodology of blind faith, as if blind were a, a you know, a, an automatic word that just had to go with faith every time you mention it. It's kind of what faith means. I don't really know why you have to qualify it. Um, faith, blind faith, is believing in something when there literally isn't a scrap of evidence. If there were a scrap of evidence, 
then it wouldn't be faith, blind faith, sorry. <laughs> As I said at the beginning, this, this is a serious misunderstanding, I think, of both faith and reason. It's a misunderstanding of faith, because we had a little quote from this uh, in the video that we started off with. So Lewis says in Religion, Reality or Substitute, faith, for him, is the art of holding on to things your reason has once accepted in spite of your changing moods. And I love this description. I think this is really good. It says, now that I'm a Christian, I do have moods in which the whole thing looks very improbable. But when I was an atheist, I had moods in which Christianity looked terribly probable. Unless you teach your moods where to get off, you can never be a sound Christian or even a sound atheist. Just a creature dithering to and fro with its beliefs really dependent on the weather and the state of its digestion. (laughs) Or a lovely turn of phrase. You know what he means. Uh, When we exhort people to faith as a virtue, something Stenger um, criticises. When we exhort people to faith as a virtue, to, to settled intention of continuing to believe certain things, we're not exhorting them to fight against reason. If we wish to be rational, not now and then, but constantly, we must pray for the gift of faith, for the power to go on believing Not in the teeth of reason, as Dawkins says, but in the teeth of lust and terror and jealousy and boredom and indifference, that which reason, authority, experience have once delivered us to be true. On the other side of that coin, the New Atheists have a misunderstanding of reason, a too narrow view of how we know reality. This is Sam Harris. He complains, look, while believing strongly without evidence is considered a mark of madness or stupidity in any other area of our lives, faith in God still holds immense prestige. But the scientific demand that everything be justified by evidence before it counts as being rational is self-contradictory. It it entails an infinite regress that's impossible to satisfy. And it's open to numerous obvious counterexamples. Quote from G.K. Chesterton, a formative influence upon Lewis, of course. Chesterton says, Let us clearly realise this fact, that we do believe in a number of things which are part of our existence but which cannot be demonstrated. All sane men, I say, believe firmly and unalterably in a certain number of things which are unproved and unprovable. Every sane man believes that the world around him and the people in it are real and not his own delusion or a dream. I believe that I am not in the matrix right now. I believe I really am in this room talking to other real people. Can I empirically demonstrate that? No way, Jose. Because whichever hypothesis were true, that I'm in the matrix or that I'm not, the empirical appearance of reality to me, my experience would be identical so you cannot use the, expe- the experience appeal to experience to tell the difference between the scenarios. Nonetheless, I believe strongly and without that kind of appeal to empirical evidence to tell the difference between the hypotheses that I'm not in the matrix. Um, doubting that the universe is more than five minutes old would be considered a mark of madness or stupidity by most people. If you met someone who sincerely believed that the universe had just sprung into existence five minutes ago, complete with, you know, trees that had rings in them that had never grown and stomachs that had partly digested food in them from meals that had never been eaten, you'd be calling for the men in white coats. (laughs) Nonetheless, 
worth pointing to the existence of tree rings or partly digested meals disprove the hypothesis in question? No. So here's a writer who, who I think does get it. And it, this, again, is an interesting source, but I'll reveal to you who the source is in a moment. This writer says that intuition, what some philosophers might talk about as properly basic beliefs, denotes the most basic constituency of our faculty of understanding. While this is true in matters of ethics, you know, I, you don't prove empirically that torturing small children for fun is wrong. The only thing you can prove empirically is that if you torture small children, they stop functioning normally. That's an empirical observation. It doesn't tell you whether you should or shouldn't do it. Okay? Uh, while this is true in method of ethics, it's no less true in science. When we can break our knowledge of a thing down no further, the irreducible leap that remains is intuitively taken. Thus, the traditional opposition between reason and intuition is a false one. Reason is itself intuitive to the core. Prove to me that the law of non-contradiction is true. Hang on a minute. Any argument I try to give you would assume the truth of the law of non-contradiction. I'd be begging the question, arguing in a circle. That doesn't prove anything, does it? Should we all give up on arguing about things? Let's not. Um, reason itself is intuitive to the core. As any judgment that a proposition is reasonable or logical relies on intuition to find its feet. The point, I trust, is obvious. We cannot step out of the darkness without taking a first step. And reason, without knowing how, understands this axiom if it would understand anything at all. The reliance on intuition, therefore, should no more be discomforting for the ethicist than it has been for the physicist, says Sam Harris in his book, The End of Faith, page 183. Interestingly, in Harris's book, The Moral Landscape, here's the one new atheist writer who thinks that science can deal with eth ethics objectively. Um, the others disagree with him. But he claims in The Moral Landscape that you can show that science can, can subsume objective ethics. But he explicitly contradicts that main thesis and contradicts this scientistic theory of knowledge that he uses to attack religion with at the same time. Um, from page 37 of The Moral Landscape, he says, science cannot tell us why, scientifically, we should value well-being. In the rest of the book, he tries to say that, that well-being is a good thing, it's an objectively good thing, and therefore science can deal with, with ethics. Um, it's confusing the is of predication, and it's like saying, you know, grass is green, so greenness is grass. It's nonsense. But um, it says it's essential to see that the demand for, for a radical justification, you know, justify everything, levelled by the moral sceptic, could not be met by science. Science is defined with reference to the goal of understanding the processes at work in the universe. Can we justify this goal scientifically? Of course not, says Sam Harris. What evidence could prove that we should value evidence? Exactly. Yeah. And yet, the new atheists will time and time again say things like, you know, faith is this blind faith, the problem with religion is you're not living up to your intellectual obligations. Is that an objective obligation? Or a subjective one? Um, and if it's objective, where does that lead? And um, most of the new atheists like J.L. Mackey, you know, Dawkins saying the universe we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is at bottom no design, no purpose, and you know, no God, no good, no evil, nothing but pitiless indifference, a morality. It's just, as Lewis talked about, just nature and the things it causes. And it happens to cause us certain feelings about things, but so what? There's no sense in which those are the things that we should feel towards torture or the slaughter of the trenches of World War I. It's just the things that blind, blind nature has unintentionally happened to cause us to feel. 
So as Lewis says, you cannot produce rational intuition by argument because argument depends upon rational intuition. Proof rests upon the unprovable, which just has to be seen. So on the one hand, faith is not automatically blind faith. But on the other hand, you can't reason unless at the foundation of reason you have a commitment to believing what you, you just see to be true, but which you cannot prove using reason or evidence. And so the new atheists both misunderstand the nature of religious faith and, at least when they're using it as a club to attack religion with, misunderstand the nature of reason. Um, but they're not wrong all the time, so when they're thinking a bit more clearly about things, you can, you can find them themselves admitting uh, what Lewis says here. So Lewis consistently rejected positivism and scientism and any sort of modernistic, narrow understanding of how we know reality. And that led him to take seriously philosophical, metaphysical arguments for theism and so on in a way that, that the new atheists just simply don't take philosophy seriously. He says it's widely believed that scientific thought does put us in touch with reality, whereas moral or metaphysical thought does not. But the distinction will not easily bear the weight that we're attempting to put on it. That distinction will not easily bear the weight that the new atheists attempt to put on it. And this difference between Lewis as an atheist and today's neo-atheists, I think, is what accounts for the stark difference in the way that they treat things like the, the kind of moral argument that W.R. Sawley uh, put in his Gifford lectures. Just one quote from the book to end with to uh, tantalise you further. <laughs> it's from the conclusion. C.S. Lewis would be the first to point out that it is illegitimate to substitute psychoanalysts for philosophical analysis. However, our philosophical review, in this bit of the book, <laughs> of the new atheist's response to natural theology naturally raises the subsidiary psychological question of why their response is so shallow. The new atheist so contrived to ignore, misunderstand, evade, and beg the question against the arguments for God and the evidence for Jesus, that they call to mind the figure C.S. Lewis once described as deliberately trying not to know whether Christianity is true or false, because he foresees endless trouble if it should turn out to be true. It's like the man who deliberately forgets to look at the notice board, because if he did, he might find his name down for some unpleasant duty. Uh, and that is actually an attitude that Lewis himself resonate, res, resonates with from his own struggle with the, with the issues. You know, and he's talking as someone who, who admits that you know, he, he had to overcome that kind of... He, he, like Hitchens, he, he sounds very much like Christopher Hitchens sometimes, and he says, I didn't want there to be... I didn't want this co cosmic um, meddler to exist. I wanted to call at least part of reality, mine. And yet he was w willing to forego um, psychological comfort in the face of where the arguments he believed uh, were pointing him as the um, motto of the Socratic club of which uh, he was president uh, here at Oxford said um, something that uh, Anthony Flew uh, referenced several times in his later years. Uh, follow the evidence wherever it leads. Thank you very much. We have time for questions or comments. Please direct your questions to me. What do the New Atheists say about um, love, joy? Mm. How, how, do they, how do they prove that? Those emotions that are very much a reality of, I'd say, every human being, but can't be proved. Yeah, this is, this is a fascinating issue, actually. What do the New Atheists say about, about issues like love and these more sort of 
intangible aspects of, of human consciousness that Lewis was talking about. I recommend actually to, here's a bit of Googling you can do, look up online an interview that happened between my boss from the Damaris Trust, Nick Pollard, and Richard Dawkins that was published in Third Way magazine a number of years ago. But it's available on the Richard Dawkins Foundation last time I looked and various other places. And during the course of that interview, Nick was pressing Dawkins exactly on this issue. What is your view of love? What does it mean in Dawkins' worldview to say, I love you? What is I? This collocation of atoms and chemical reactions and so on, and, and you, another chunk of material stuff unintentionally thrown up by a blind universe of pitying indifference. Um, well, what's this love, you know? Well, basically, Dawkins, it, it reduces to, you know, re reductive view of reality, it reduces down to basically saying, um, hey, the evolutionary uh, past of my species has, has given this chunk of matter a, uh, a, a, a certain um, sexual drive and feelings of attachment um, that will at least last long enough for my DNA to mix with yours uh, to, the, uh, to the betterment of the genetic diversity of our species. So romantic, isn't it? <laughs> um, now, of course, Dawkins... You know, I'm sure he has the same human feeling that the rest of us do for his wife, Lala Ward, um, ex-Doctor Who assistant, and uh, well, I'm a Doctor Who fan as well. Um, but when he tries to explain what that is, because it's a matter-first worldview, matter came first, mind, um, whatever you, type of reality you ascribe to it, is a latecomer, an unintended latecomer in reality. Um, that depends upon this mindless, unintentional, purposeless, um, A-value kind of reality. And so you end up with a sort of reductionistic view. And as I say in the book, you end up with kind of two types of atheist response to this. You get the sort of um, nihilistic true grit response that actually attracted... Lewis at one stage when he was like reading Bertrand Russell's A Free, Man, Free Man's Worship and so on and sort of saying we have to build our lives on the scaffolding of unyielding despair that kind of you know haranguing heaven itself of being such a senseless cosmos kind of the Promethean response as Lewis called it and then came to see it as a Promethean fallacy or you get this sort of debonair nihilism of some atheists that sort of say yes it's all meaningless but I can have my own subjective private Feelings. I can have my own subjective purposes and feelings in life, and you know it feels just as nice to be in love to me as it does to a theist. So, what's what's you know? Does that really make a difference? I think it makes a difference, but I'll leave that with you to ponder. Yeah. <laughs> it still requires just as much faith to accept that thought process then. You know, a religious person's um, thoughts on love and joy and all the other stuff. There's no, you, I mean, like, and I understand yeah. you're trying to, you're on, you know, the same side that I am, but that you, you still haven't come up with any type of proof from their side of why it's here and where it came from. But yeah, I understand it's, there you can't get one, but. Right, yeah, well, you mean, what, what is the explanation of why the feelings of love exist from, from the materialist worldview? It, it, it's basically an illusion fobbed off on us by our selfish genes. Yeah. It, however, you know, you have to go into the sort of mind, mind body issue. Whatever you make of the relationship between mind and body, you know, um, on a materialist view, it, you, you, it just happens to be that something happens that throws up this mechanism that happens to have certain feelings attached to it. If it's useful enough, not deleterious, it's useful enough, it gets selected for, and it spreads. Um, but it's not meant to be there, it's not meant to spread, it's, it, it just is. Um, to go beyond that would be the whole sort of human is ought fallacy, say. So. Yeah, question here? Yes, yeah. I've experienced this as well. Like, I feel like one of my atheist friends, they mm. do really hurt hold as a priori beliefs, scientism and logical um, positivism, but it sounds like what you're saying is that often it's because they don't want those cosmic matter. They, they, they don't want Christianity to be true. They don't want God to exist, but or maybe not. In some cases, perhaps, but I don't know. I, yeah. Like Something I've thought about as well is 
that maybe one of our categories of how we can find a worldview to be true or not is, is it actually livable? Like, mm. have you actually worked out the logical conclusions of your worldview? And I feel like in a lot of my conversations, a lot of my friends who are really strong mm. atheists, they don't. I, I try and put mm. the question, okay, so what if you die and you cease to, to exist? And you have no conscious recollection of anything, of even any of the subjective meaning that you've experienced in this worldview. Mm. Mm. Then, then what? But for s some reason, it seems that they're always able to Kind of just put that aside, or they're not willing to go there. Does Lewis ever respond to that, and how? Yeah. There are, as I say, these, these kind of two atheist reactions to the objective meaninglessness of existence. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you get the agreement up to the point of saying, okay, materialist worldview, there are no objective values, there's no given intrinsic purpose to reality, mm -hmm. um, and so on. But then you get these, you know, do we sort of say, Let's be, um, you know, build our lives on this foundation of unyielding despair. You know, just because it's, you know, a fairy tale existence would be nice, but that doesn't make it true. Just because it, it would be nice, and you've got to you've got to face up to reality in a sort of gird your loins, manly kind of a way. You know, mm -hmm. and sort of say, okay, I'm not going to give in to despair. I'm going to sort of uh, Nietzscheanly kind of meet life head on kind of thing. And that was the attitude that attracted Lewis when he was a an atheist. And then you get the atheists who sort of, sort of say, yeah, okay, there's no objective, blah, 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 but hey, you know, rainbows still f feel beautiful to me. And they're not actually. Um, just because I don't believe there are objective values doesn't mean I have to go out and start murdering people. You know, I don't like that. Um, <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I, I'm going to live in a way that makes me feel nice about things and that includes sort of generally being a nice kind of chap and I'm not going to live my life terribly differently from someone who does believe in objective values therefore and then also why does the whole thing matter why does it does you know okay we're all doomed in the heat extinction of the universe and so on but yeah that's a long way off you know um <laughs> I've had something that really like thinking like I, I when I talk to people who express this with views it doesn't seem that they really think the like, very often, maybe they haven't had, like, a close friend mm. just suddenly die. Do you mm. know what I mean? Like, I don't really think they're thinking in the context of, like, their own yeah. mentality. Yeah. Well, well, humans are very good. We're good at avoiding issues, aren't we? Yeah. You know, um, <laughs> of course. I thought, I thought one time that um, Lewis might avoid certain things. I, I mentioned to him, having seen um, the oh. Uh, Ripley's Believe in a Mark. Mm. But it shows, um, anyway, it said in front of this picture of, of a graveyard, here lies an atheist, all dressed up with, with a notepad to go. Hmm. And I thought that ended the matter. And Lewis said, I bet he wishes that was so. Mm. Mm. So just because, you know, you can want that, and pretend that it's true to Lewis. You know, objective reality mm. really did take place. Mm. You know, and probably the atheist really did wish he did not what was true. Mm. Mm. And on sides, another thing of Lewis is, which I think, you know, counts against um, the new atheist, is that on science itself, Lewis says there's no such thing as science. Science is not a person. Mm, mm. Scientists say different things, yeah. but science itself never says anything. Mm, mm. Absolutely, yeah. I think that's, that's a very good point. Scientists say things, yeah, yeah. and what they say is, of course, as scientists, partly motivated by their scientific knowledge of reality, yeah, yeah. whatever their specialism is. But it's also partly motivated by their personal philosophy. Uh, and that philosophy influences their interpretation of data. So, for example, yeah, we can. Um, you could have a scientist like um, James Watson, co-discoverer of DNA molecule, who was an ardent atheist, and a scientist like Francis Collins, who was head of the Human Genome Project. And was an ardent Christian. He was an ardent Christian. And they, those two scientists both agree about 
what science tells them about their specialism area of, of genetics. <coughs> They're not fighting about genetics, but they are at odds about their worldview. And it's not that you look at science and science tells you what worldview to have. Um, scientific knowledge can play a role in the arguments on, on every side of the issue, but you don't go from science to worldview. What really having you go from worldview to how does that m make me see what science tells me about the world? How do I interpret what science is telling us? How do I fit that with my philosophical, my larger philosophical understanding of reality? Um, you want them at least to cohere. Um, if not integrate, you certainly don't want them to contradict each other. Um, but, yeah, so you, you get this scientific ag agreement doesn't need, mean philosophical agreement uh, about the worldview issue. Um, just another, before we had just another comment back on what you were saying, just want to make it clear that I wasn't at the end wanting to, uh, I particularly read that line out about not wanting to substitute psychoanalysis, psychoanalysis for philosophical analysis. It's just that I got, a, got to the point with the new atheists in the book where I think they are exhibiting that characteristic of, of avoiding actually really engaging with the issue. Uh, and I think they do, at least some of them very clearly, display that kind of attitude. But it's not an attitude that I at all want to ascribe to everyone who disagrees with me. Uh, the, 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 the philosophical debate has to happen first. Um, you know, the whole Freudian... I mean, Lewis engaged a lot with the whole Freudian thing, particularly in the Pilgrim's Regress and so on, of, you know, you, you only believe in God because you want, you know, you want this large father figure to make you feel nice about life and everything. And so, well, two can play at that game. You know, you only don't believe in God because you've got a sort of divine Oedipal complex, you know. We can sling psychoanalytics at each other all day, but that's really to avoid the philosophical debate. You've got to do that first, yeah. Okay. You have two questions. Please, yeah, go on. Um, you said that some of the new atheists would reject, um, rather, than, rather than accept the reality of the God, they would reject objective value and reject mm. ethics. Are these ever the same new atheists who say that religion is not just false, but it's also a, a moral evil? Yeah, they're exactly the same. Yeah, this is the irony of the... I wonder what Professor Kirkpatrick would say to that. Yeah, exactly, exactly, that's it, yeah. I agree. Since that was short, and snappy. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, did I interrupt you? No, no, that's fine. I'm just happy to, to say good comment. <laughs> that short and snappy, we have, we, we have another two questions. Um, uh, Michael Ward and James Crocker. After that, if anyone wants to continue discussion with our speaker, he will be visiting the uh, <clears throat> fine dine restaurant Lamb and Flag across the street <laughs> after the talk, and you're all welcome, any, any one of you, every one of you. But please, Michael Ward. Thanks for an excellent talk, um, Peter. I think Lewis, am I right in saying that Lewis would say that you can, um, you can hope at any rate to argue people into theism? But you can't really argue them into Christianity. But anyway, he himself mm. says that when he became a Christian, that the transformation happened not through any great thought nor through any great emotion. It, mm. it, it involved, as he implies elsewhere, a, a supervention of, of, the, of the divine. The alteration of the will, which, which refuses to identify Jesus as the Christ, um, that that alteration of the will cannot happen except by um, the illuminating gift of the Holy Spirit. So, I mean, how, how, apologetics mm. is, a, is a great task, but how far does it actually go? Can it get to theism but not Christianity? Mm. Interesting question. Okay. Try and give a brief response. Um, Lewis distinguished between what philosophers nowadays would call faith that and faith in. They call them faith A and faith B. Um, and so it's, it's one thing to be convinced that something is true. And it is another and more personal issue to take a step of putting your trust in the thing or person that you believe is true. Um, and he said that arguments are presumably uh, there to try and produce the, the faith that, the faith that there is God, the faith 
that Jesus is who Christians think he was. And you know, gave his famous lunatic liar lord argument and, and so on. But when it comes to the choice to put your faith in, this is, of course, not a, a matter of proving that something is the case. Uh, he memorably says, when you come to believe that, 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 that God is there, you're no longer faced with the, the conclusion of an argument asking for your assent, but you're faced with a person asking for your trust. And so I, I think that he would say arguments can, can can deal with the faith that, both with God and with, with Jesus, seem to give arguments for believing that Jesus is a Christian to think he is. But it's like leading a horse to water. <laughs> you know, arguments are, you know, back to this uh, thing of Sam Harris saying, you know, how, could you, how could you argue or show in poetry or whatever that you should value evidence, that you should do something is more a matter of, of intuition and saying as I should and there's yet another thing to say so, so am I going to do it <laughs> so it's real I think it's there I think he's really asking for my faith and trust am I going to do it um, and he does this, this, this image doesn't he I forget where it is he says the, sort of the, the spirit that he was coming to think was God gave him this this impression of, of himself as a sort of man in a suit of armour. And that armour was kind of keeping out the, the spirit. And he, he was presented with a moment of, of, of he says, completely free choice that either he could keep himself locked up against the spirit or he could open up. Uh, and there was no sort of threats and promise. He, he could see that there would be incalculable differences if he, if he opened up. But, um, and then he records about coming to believe in Jesus, this, this, this bike rider, when he was in the sidecar of a bike, and he says, when I, when, I think they were going on a visit to Whipsay Zoo, wasn't it? He says, when I, when I got into the sidecar, I didn't believe in Jesus. When I got out, I did. <laughs> um, but there'd been a lot, of, a lot of thinking about who Jesus was before that. <laughs> but this was the actual going to make that, that affirmation of faith in. Um, and I think that's sort of where he would, would draw the line of where argument gets you to and where it doesn't. Yeah. Thank you. Last question in QC House. There will be 50 more questions in Latin <laughs> flag, but this is the last question in QC House. Thanks. Um, hi, thanks for your talk. I, I was completely on board with the second section about denials of logical positivism and scientism. Um, but I thought there's a kind of interesting quirk to mm. the ar argument you used in the first half, which was focusing on the moral argument for the existence mm -hmm. of God. Um, and I thought this became evident in a discrepancy between the quote from J.L. Mackey and the syllogism you presented. Mm. The syllogism was something along the lines of, um, if there is no such thing, if there is no God, then there is no such thing as moral evil. If there is moral evil, therefore there is a God, mm. uh, which works as a syllogism. Um, the the quote you had from J.L. Mackey said something along the lines of, um, if there are objective moral facts, then it makes it more probable that mm. God exists. Okay. Yeah. Making it more probable that God exists does not entail that God exists, mm. which means that J.L. Mackey is disagreeing with the first premise of your argument um, that you attributed to Lewis. Um, mm. Mm. And I think he's right to disagree with that. Um, so that it's very typical in moral arguments for the existence of God to assert that if objective moral facts exist, then God must exist. Mm. But I have really never seen anything to motivate that. Mm -hmm. Why should anyone accept that? So if I'm um, not quite a, a scientist, a, somebody who accepts scientism, but mm. if I'm somebody who um, thinks that every sort of every truth has a reason, so if I affirm mm. some sort of strong principle of sufficient reason, mm -hmm. then I might want to say, okay, why are there these objective moral facts? But many modern philosophers either deny the principle of sufficient reason or they mm. have a much weakened version of it. So I suppose my, my question is, why do you think it can't be the case that there are objective moral facts if there is no God, and the second part of that is, if it can be the fact that there, that there are objective moral facts without mm. there being a God, then C.S. Lewis's argument 
from moral realism to, to theism doesn't work, but his argument from, from objective evil to the non-existence of God probably does work. Right, okay. Uh, there's quite a lot of <laughs> questions in that question, I think. Um, we could, of course, simply substitute um, a probably into the syllogism that I put up there uh, to put Mackie and Lewis on a par, but yes, he was putting it in a, in a deductive kind of f- form, like Sawley does. Um, I think the two routes you could go with this. One is to take up your issue about the principle of sufficient reason, and we could have a talk about that. But I think perhaps even if we went with a very um, weak version of the principle of sufficient reason, like um, um, uh, Alexander Pruss's um, version of the principle of sufficient reason, which is that if something um, possibly has an explanation and is true, then it probably has an explanation. Um, You could... I think, still work an argument that rested on a very weak version of the, the principle of sufficient reason would still get you something. You don't need a very strongly worded principle. The other route, through, route through that um, Lewis would have been more familiar with from people like Sawley, and you could look at people like H.P. Owen uh, later on as well, or um, A.E. Taylor, another contemporary of Lewis's, um, would point out that by its nature, an objective moral um, standard or ideal is something that prescribes our behaviour rather than describing it. It obligates our behaviour and it is an ideal of behaviour. Um, but an ideal, what sort of ontological furniture of reality does that fit? at least best with, an ideal seems to imply a mind. How do you have a prescription without a prescriber? How can you be obligated to anything that's impersonal? You can only be obligated to a personal reality, but it's a transcendent objective moral standard that trumps you, me, us, my society, the United Nations. Um, All of those individuals, groups, can be wrong in their moral commands and requirements upon us and we are absolutely obligated to follow the moral law but I can only be obligated by a personal reality but what is a objective transcendent yet personal prescribing ideal holding reality except some kind of personal non-physical transcendent holy good being um, so it's through an analysis of well, what kind of thing is an objective moral value, given that they exist, and what uh, ontological picture of reality does that fit with? At least, you know, in a weak version of the argument, on the best explanation kind of view, or if you want to put it deductively, you could say, look, you know, how on earth do you have an obligation without someone to whom I am obligated, and who right, who, who I am who is rightfully exercising an absolute obligation and prescription upon my behaviour. So it would be that kind of route that um, Lewis and Footsie, people like Rashtal, HPON, A.E. Taylor would take. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we wish you the best, and we hope that the book sells a lot. It's quite evident that it will, um, and we're very honoured that you chose the Oxford C.S. Lewis Society to launch I'm your book. Honoured myself. <laughs> um, the, uh, there were so many pre-orders, apparently, that the publisher, Mr. Mike Parsons, doubled the number of books he was initially going to carry. <laughs> So if, you, if you're interested, please get your copy or copies from, from the staff, and uh, Mr. Williams will be happy to, to sign it. If you just sit for a while, for two more minutes, um, C.S. Lewis contributed in many fields during his lifetime, and especially after.